I'm actually in the deflation camp. I, I don't even believe in disinflation. Because if you think about, and, and this is a, a free economics degree for, for, for those who doesn't have it. I give you one in, in, in 10 seconds. If you take all of economics and boil it down to what really matters in, in economics, there are three things that matter. And two of them are relevant for this question. One is demographic, so the next change is demographic. And the other one is productivity. Productivity is the single most imp important factor. If you live in a productive country, if you, if you own a productive equity uh, stock, uh, you can never lose money simply by the definition of, of productivity. And of course, the, the final one being the marginal cost of capital needs to dictate where capital goes. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the EdJR Mining Guy on Twitter and the CEO of the Soar Financial Group. And tremendously appreciative of you joining us here yet again for another interesting discussion on the macro landscape. There is so much going on, especially this week. I've posted it on Twitter and also on uh, in our YouTube community notes. The Bank of England, the Bank of Japan, and of course the U.S. Fed are meeting this week and making their interest rate announcements, and we're being uh, you know, provided with lots more other data points uh, out of Europe, out of uh, Japan, out of China. We've been provided with some interesting data this morning as well. So lots to talk about and to, lots to make sense of, because of course everybody wants to know where are things headed. It seems like we're in a market melt-up phase, especially in the U.S. The S&P is still rallying, but also other asset classes. Gold is nearing all it was near an all-time high. Bitcoin has been at an all-time high. Many other asset classes rallying as well. Copper is showing signs of life. So I'm really curious where, where things are headed. And, and I think I've invited the perfect guests for this discussion. It is Stein Jakobsen. He's the CIO over at Danish Bank Sa Saxa Bank. And I'm really excited for him to join us. Stein, it's a pleasure to meet you and thanks for making the time. It's a pleasure being on your show, Kai. I look forward to the conversation. Absolutely. No, Stan, really appreciate it. And uh, why don't we just dive right in and uh, let's start gauging a bit of the, the, the macro landscape that we're in. Like, how healthy is the economy right now and uh, the financial markets? Well, the, you know, depends, depends on uh, what angle you want to go uh, at it uh, from. If you look at the growth rate, if you look at the consumer spending, of course, most people will tell you that the economy is in a great shape. But what is beneath that and what is really driving it, of course, is that we've had an unprecedented fiscal boost from the U.S. And through the fiscal boost, we have spent in the U.S. $3 trillion and we've had an output to show for it at $2.4 trillion, uh, of course, a net loss of $600 billion. So, you know, depending on whether you want to focus on the debt side of why we have the growth or whether you want to focus on the data right now, the answers are two different ones. One is that it's kind of okay. And the other one is that we are really just uh, spending money from the future in terms of increasing the amount of debt loads. And I think probably the single most important thing I can say to your viewers is, remember 2024 is a year where 50% of the world population go to the polls. Why is that important? It's important because nothing, absolutely nothing can or may go wrong in the economy and the stock markets in 24. That sets up this kind of uh, almost artificial market where we are playing Monopoly in the equity game, where we are just waiting for the pain to dry on the cost of capital. And at the same time, we see the social infliction, the social contract is under heavy attack across the board. And of course, it will show up uh, uh, as, as one number one topic, in my opinion, in the US election. Absolutely. No, fantastic. Stan. Again, I just took a full page of notes while you were chatting. So lots to follow up on, of course. Um, and I think that you, we need to discuss what kind of landing scenario you're envisioning also to, just to get the mindset for the, for this conversation, because we're always seemingly doom and gloom on this channel. But it's tough to get away from the macro indicators, leading indicators, but also lagging indicators. It's tough to get away from that doom and gloom scenario. Right. So I'm curious, uh, Stan, what, what, what camp are you in? No landing, soft landing, very hard landing. I'm curious what you're thinking. I'm, I'm not a philosopher. I'm not a I'm not uh, even a good economist. I'm a practitioner. I'm a guy who managed money and tried to make a little bit of uh, of the green ones uh, week by week and month by month. And I think the way to approach your question is really just to say, in my lifetime, I've never seen a recession with full employment. That, that is sort of the simple answer to your question. 
in order for things to deteriorate on the economic side and for the doom and gloom to actually become a front page news story, we need to see a significant slowdown of the labor market. I think, as it happens, that is it's coming. But again, 24 is an unusual year. Uh, you know, m- many moons ago, we coined the phrase of pretended extend, pretend that you are having integrity and extend by buying time. And 24, in my opinion, is already a lost year in economics, in socioeconomic uh, uh, standards, and certainly for the markets. Uh, 24 is a year where the manipulation will be uh, at the forefront of everything. So landing or no landing doesn't really matter. What you need to focus on is the fact that we come off a period with huge fiscal spending, which is going to be difficult to repeat in 2024 because it is an election year. Uh, and at the same time, the economic data takes longer to sort of work out the positive momentum that you created from COVID, the post-COVID open up of the economy, and then the massive stimulus that uh, President Biden and his colleagues in the cabinet has been pushing into the U.S. economy. It's unprecedented. As you can probably tell with my lack of year, uh, lack of hair, I've been around for more than uh, four. Uh, this is my fourth decade. Uh, it's probably a diplomatic way of, of phrasing this. And I, I've never seen this amount of debt before in my life. And yeah, I respect it as a as a market player that this is a slow moving train. It's a little bit like a freight train leaving the, the platform. It's not a TGV. It's not a fast, mm-hmm. rapid uh, 300 kilometers an hour a Chinese uh, express train that is leaving. It's a freight train. And the impact on monetary policy, the sort of wish of the market to get uh, day-by-day uh, confirmation of data signals is not happening simply because it takes time to work all of these impulses and the sizes of these impulses through the economy. No, absolutely. And um, I've been writing down, again, a few comments that I want to follow up on. And uh, let, let's start with the labor market there, Stan. And uh, you're, you're seeing cracks. And I'm curious, like, w- where are those cracks coming from? Because I'm trying to understand a bit of the fundamentals, the underlying fundamentals. Like, where is it happening? We've seen UPS lay off 12,000 workers, which usually doesn't happen in a great economy. But I think you mentioned or somebody else mentioned um, LA port data that is increasing as well. So you need more workers as well. So I'm curious, where, where do you see the... Uh, uh, the cracks appearing in the labor market? So the U.S. economy is a 70% consumer-driven economy, which, of course, makes L.A. ports uh, important for the import side of the economy. But where we look at the labor market, it is extremely confusing, even for a veteran like me to interpret the data. I mean, we are suggested that, that non-farm payrolls makes any sense. I think anyone who's ever spent more than two minutes looking at the non-farm payroll knows that the revision is in excess of 50% uh, month by month. And all of the sort of adjustment that you see to non-farm is negative. So the data point as a valid sort of statistical element in your predicting the labor market is zero. What many economists do today and a lot of hedge fund use is warn notices. Uh, the fact that in the US, if you have to lay out, I think it's more than, than 20 people, you have to put in a warn notice ahead of time. Those are increasing. We see that the uh, retained of talent is difficult. And the leading indicator that people use is the quit rate. And why would the quit rate be so important? Because the confidence of the employee is reflected in that number. Less people are likely to be quitting their job if they think they are not having better opportunities elsewhere or they're a little bit nervous about their own job. Uh, so those those are already showing up. And if you look at the even if you look at the base book and you look at the economic activity, it's pretty much 50-50 through the districts in the U.S., whether you see economic activity or a little bit of a slowdown of the activity. So, again, I'm back to my sort of uh, my, 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 my ice melting uh, analogy of things being very, very slow. But at the margin, we are seeing not a total collapse in the labor market yet. But we're definitely seeing a normalization. We're seeing that the jobless claims, uh, the, the running tally, but also the four-week average is, is edging north. Uh, but all of these sort of high-frequency data that we look at is, is actually flashing that we probably see a significant increase in the unemployment over the course of the March months, the April months, and the June months. Absolutely. You know, in, in, interesting tidbits there. Like the quits or the quit rate is really, really interesting because the confidence number, as you said, so based based on the analogy, like the quit rate should be fairly low because people are worried that they won't find a job elsewhere, 
right? So um, I think that's uh, pretty pretty obvious. Uh, just anywhere you look, you don't really want to switch jobs right now because you try to improve <laughs> when you switch jobs. You don't try to you know downgrade your position as well. So um, another interesting point you mentioned there was the debt side, and uh, I, I briefly tried, uh, tried to you know look up U.S. presidential candidate, uh, candidates and their stance on the U.S. debt. I couldn't find much. They, both candidates haven't really announced much yet in terms of program they will be running on. Um, but the U.S. debt is not a topic highly uh, discussed or that's being discussed a lot. And we're sitting at $34.5 trillion of U.S. debt right now. I think debt service payments, I think, which is an interesting factor, is over a trillion dollars now. Right. Um, and you mentioned monetary policy. So, like, how, how does that fit all together? Like, where do you, how do you see this developing? You said pretend and extend, of course, but uh, how far, how much further can we ca uh, kick the can down the road there, Steen? Well, if you ask Janet Yellen, you can continue forever because no one is doubting the ability of the US to repay its debt. But, uh, but I think the market, to some extent, in the uh, third uh, quarter last year, was disciplining the bond market and the U.S. government in the process. Of course, what I'm alluding to here is the fact that we saw a sky-high 10-year interest rate above the 5% handle, and that really scared the market off. To some extent, we're already now, again, retesting kind of the lows because of the massive issues we see. But as the U.S. is a lender of last resource, they can go to uh, the basement and print as much money as they want. But... Having said that, there is, of course, a limit to how much the market will be able and willing to accept. And, and one of the issues that we're going to meet in the next quarter is, is actually this net liquidity availability to buy what the U.S. government is issuing. Uh, one of the main concerns here is what is called the reverse repo. Uh, for people who are not familiar with the reverse repo, it's a little bit like a parking lot for excess capital from the banking system. That has been drawn down and that has been a positive impulse to the equity market because, of course, as this money goes out of the sort of uh, Fed, it goes into the banking system that then can use the multiplier to use it. We are seeing that bank net lending adjusted for inflation is negative. So the banks are not providing additional liquidity to the system. And on top of that, we have, uh, of course, the QT continuing somewhere between 80 and $100 billion a month. If you add these three numbers together, the ability of the U.S. Treasury and through the Fed to go to the market and find buyers is getting increasingly difficult. Hence, we see the incre incremental increase in 10-year bonds. So, you know, again, I I'm sorry I'm, I'm so, uh, so diluted in my answer, but the, the answer is there are no black and white. And I know especially financial press loves to have uh, black and white. My customer loves black and white. But the, the fact here is that the big issue that the economy faces, despite the, the good uh, labor market, despite the good growth rates that so far is in, in the numbers, we have a liquidity constraint uh, going into this month. And that probably also means, as we look ahead to March, a Fed meeting, the market is focused on whether we're going to get two or three dots. But Fed is going to be concerned about how do they tweak the QT, either by pausing it, indicating a halving of it, or in any shape or form, making sure liquidity is uh, ambulant and is, is, is ample enough in the system. Don't forget that, and people forget that in economic history, that nine out of 10 rate cuts that we've seen for Federal Reserve have been based on illiquidity of the market. Not because we had a recession, because basically we haven't had a real recession for, for a number of decades. So Federal Reserve will always have a priority number one, two, and three on the liquidity on the market. And that's probably where one of the biggest gaps right now is between how I see the market and how the average pundits see the market. They are concerned about, oh, is Fed going to do two or three dots? I go like, I couldn't care less because I have a golden retriever. She's called Nelly. She's 10 years old. She's predicted the dots better than any <laughs> of the Fed board members over the last 30 years. So, you know, it, it's a random walk a process in terms of those dots. That doesn't mean anything. But because the market is so data point by data point, by information by information focus, they make it into something that is significant. But what is significant for the Federal Reserve is the slowdown that they see in the labor market gradually, but more importantly, the illiquidity risk and the fact that they end up in a situation where there isn't ample enough liquidity in the system to sort of juice the, uh, the engines. No. 
Steen, I'm venturing into an area that I know very little of, admittedly, and that's uh, the bank term funding program and uh, how, how that sort of works. Because I know it is running out at the end of this month, I believe, as well, which could be a huge liquidity factor. Since you brought up the topic of liquidity, I wrote that down as well. I just want to seek maybe some clarification and understanding of what that actually could mean as well. Because in combination with QT, the quantitative tightening, uh, the reverse repo facility running out of funds as well, like how, how much more could that uh, – or how much more can the system take in that regard as well? So the bank funding program, of course, was initiated uh, post the SVB uh, bank failure that we saw in March last year, so exactly one year old. And now, as you say, they are retiring. And not end of the month, actually, this week or last week, it was being retired. Okay. However, the way it works is that up until the closure of the program uh, this week, uh, you could still do 12 months forward. So the real impact is 12 months going forward. And the net size, last time I checked, I think it was about $175 billion, is also disappearing from the system. But that's one of these uh, exogenous factors in, in sort of the overall liquidity factor. It is not positive, but it's not super negative. But it will have potentially impact if I'm right about the slowdown, the overall activity. If I'm right about the slowdown in the aggregate liquidity pattern, then, of course, we could see an increase focus on the regional banks and their ability to fund themselves. And of course, this topic has not become smaller, considering that the commercial real estate books of these banks are significantly higher than the major center banks. So, so there is still something out there in all of these positive sort of the momentum, the election year uh, stimulus that we see that, that can sort of uh, bring about the surprise to the marketplace. No. Talking about surprise to the marketplace, and uh, I've, I mentioned to you, I'm going to ask about commercial real estate as well, because the market seems to be ignoring it, in, in my opinion, just looking at the S&P. Uh, everything seems to be honky-dory. Everybody's worry-free, right? Um, how much of a risk is the commercial real estate market, in your opinion, given the lag effects and what we're seeing right now in terms of refinancing some of those mortgage rates? The, the best way to answer that question is to look at the profile of the actual refinancing that needs to happen. So if you look at for the sort of helicopter perspective, Fed needs to finance the banks, they need to finance the treasury, and they need to make sure the refinancing of uh, commercial real estate and private equity is happening over the course of the next three years. That is objective number one for the system itself uh, to be to bring in, to bring that about. Uh, and if you look at the CIE and uh, in investor, uh, sorry, the, the, the maturity profile, 25 is really the big year for, for commercial real estate. In 24, what we've seen in the credit market so far has been an ability for the best of the credits to uh, get refinanced and refinanced, at, as you can see from the credit spread, at reasonable rates. I think 25 is a very different story. One, because it will be time plus one year uh, away from here. And, and I think the overall economic pattern, the ability of banks to lend will then be at its full uh, negative forced power in terms of the ability. So, so for me, you know, the banks, as I talk to them around the world, are very keen on uh, lending money to industry, to industry, to AI projects, to financing of uh, infrastructure, green transformation. They are far more, uh, uh, far bigger uh, more fearing the, the commercial real estate and consumer lending right now. And, and of course, I, I think that is another reason why we have to be slightly cautious, still accepting that 24 is a pretend and extend and a nothing year. But, but 25, I think it's a different story. No, I appreciate that answer there. I'm curious, like, how is the Fed taking that into consideration now, what you're saying, like, pretend and extend, meaning is that higher for longer? Or can they actually proactively manage what is going to happen in 2025? And we all know the, for the Fed is usually not forward looking because they rely on lagging indicators, economic indicators, right? So, um, you know, trying to make the segue a bit to the Fed discussion now as well. But uh, I'm curious, like, how, how much are they taking that into effect? And how, how much can they? That absolutely taking into effect because you have to remember the Federal Reserve has tried to reverse engineer those three challenges that I just outlined. And if they do do that, they will be more likely than not to cut interest rate. Because if, if you live in an economy which needs refinancing and has a high level of absolute debt, what is the only one, what, what is the single parameter, what is the single input factor that can actually drop the burden of that? That, of course, is the four geo. It is the four cost of capital, relatively speaking. And as you and I talk, you know, depending on how you measure it, 
Real rates in the U.S. is somewhere between 200 and 300 basis points. Doing refinancing at a positive 200, 300 uh, a real rates uh, environment is almost impossible for the U- not just for the U.S., but for the global uh, economy at large, because we are simply not there in terms of productivity. We are not there in terms of capital use. It is increasing the public spending that is driving the overall growth rate. So the mix is wrong. And for Fed, the only thing they can do, and playing to the pretend extent, it is to be at the first ability, at the first data set that confirms their theory, they will be cutting interest rate and far more aggressively than the market uh, thinks because that is the way they solve the obligation of the small and and regional banks, the uh, commercial real estate business, the private equity, and everything that sits in that structure of needing lower funding rates. Let's talk about the lag effects going into the the, the rate cut decision as well, because let's assume a 25 basis point cut. Like, A, how long does it take to, to filter through the system? And, and B, how meaningful is that even, right? Even looking forward, because 25 basis points isn't it's pretty much a nothing burger, quite honestly. So I'm curious, um, also maybe as part C of that question, how symbolic is a rate cut as well? And what could be the ramifications? What could the market interpret into that? You're absolutely right. 25 basis points on, on the margin doesn't really change the projection uh, projection of the economy. But what it do, does do is it stops the higher and higher level of financing cuts to the U.S., to the CRE, and to the banking system. And and in order to get this down, we need to see interest rate by uh, this time next year needs to be at least 100, if not 200 basis point lower. We basically need to take away all of the positive real days that we have. Let's assume it's uh, about 200 basis point positive now. We may be able to uh, do all of these refinancing at 50 basis points positive, but I doubt it because if you look at the uh, average uh, real rates that we had over the last decade, it's been negative in the case of the US, in, case in the Japan, in Europe, in, in the UK, and in, in, in the US. So to me, we need the 200 basis point. And the first cut, I mean, if you think about the challenge we have in the market right now, we know what the path is going to be that's lower. We know where the target is that's down to 2% inflation. What we do not know is when we start. So it is significant when when they start, sorry. So what is significant in the first 25 basis point is not the 25 basis point itself. It could also be 50 if, you know, the, lo- the, the longer they stay higher for longer, the more they will need to cut eventually. That is just that mathematical truth. But... But the fact is that that will start, that will initiate the the sort of the the downside on on the, on the cycle and confirm that the Federal Reserve is no longer in a position of wait and see. They are definitely not in a position that has sneaked into the uh, the narrative recently that they will not cut interest rate in in 24. So you know, if answered differently, for three two two three months ago, 25 basis points wouldn't have made a a huge difference. Now it makes a huge difference only because it's reassess and reset the trajectory to one where we're going to see a multiple number of cuts in order to deal with and mitigate these incoming refinancing needs in in, in the three big uh, se- sectors that I talk about. Okay, fantastic. No, Steen, thanks for clarifying that. Really interesting. Um, l- let's come with, at it from a different angle. We've talked unemployment uh, as well. L- let's talk inflation because that's the other big t- uh, job that the, the Fed has is control inflation. And uh, d- do you see inflation under control? Official numbers are at 3.2%, a little higher than forecast last time. Uh, true inflation, another indicator, sits at around 2.1%. So I'm curious, uh, ha- has the inflation beast been tamed, Steen? I was a, a big inf- inflation, inflation Easter in, uh, in 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 uh, in in a couple of years ago. Now I'm actually in the deflation camp. I, I don't even believe in disinflation, because if you think about and and this is a, a free economics degree for 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 those who doesn't have it. I give you one in 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 ten seconds. If you take all of economics and boil it down to what really matters in in economics, there are three things that matter. And two of them are relevant for this question. One is demographic, so the next change is demographic. And the other one is productivity. Productivity is the single most in- important factor. If you live in a productive country, if you, li- if you own a productive equity uh, stock, uh, you can never lose money simply by the definition of, of productivity. And of course, the, the final one being the marginal cost of capital 
needs to dictate where capital goes, but that's not irrelevant for this. But if we look at demographics, uh, obviously we will uh, see a significant uh, decrease of people in the working force globally over the next couple of years, which is deflationary in itself. And then we come to the big uh, two letter words that uh, everybody wants to talk about AI. I, 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 you know, I'm too old to actually talk about this because uh, most of the young viewers would say I, I have no clue. But, but, but uh, for, my, for my chair, uh, AI is significant in the science space, far more than this uh, interface link that's done so you, you can do your thesis in university in five minutes uh, and, and whatever. But if you look at what's going on right now in energy, in uh, fusion energy, uh, the, the computer power and harvesting that and using AI intelligence means that... Uh, and, and, and I know a lot of uh, commentators is, is criticizing me for this view, but I do think inside the next five to 10 years, we will put fusion energy at scale into the energy system. And that will take significantly down the cost of energy. Uh, it will also at the same time solve, uh, because there are no negative impact from it environmentally, uh, the, the pollution that goes on in the world. I actually think, uh, Kay, to be honest, that, you know, Answering your question, we need to look for what happens in the next 10 to 15 years. There is bigger than a 50-50 chance that the margin cost of energy is moving towards zero in the next 10 years, far more so than this the doom and gloom story that oil is going to 250 because there isn't enough of it. And, and if I put that into the equation of what is ongoing at company level, so from here we did it from the top down, now I'm going to do it from the bottom up. You know, if you look at law companies, if you look at uh, any data set that has a limited parameter around it, limited use, AI is, is, is a genius construction for that because it doesn't iterate new concept. It doesn't, uh, as we've seen in Google's example, we don't redefine history with, with different characteristics. But if you have a finite data set in science, in law, in uh, robots, probably on, uh, on, on customer servicing, it's going to be a huge uh, boon for, for, for the productivity. We're already starting to see productivity is kicking up. And that's one of the things that Federal Reserve is certainly looking at, that all of a sudden from you know zero to one uh, productivity range, we are now in a two to three. And if I look back to, and, and you probably remember that as well, Kai, if we look back to the sort of the hay years of 97 to 2000, when we had the last boom and bust, that was driven by a huge amount of productivity gains. And if, 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 if I'm right about productivity and investment into productivity is going to happen, then inflation is just a cursory uh, concern because the supply side will be solved by, by, by exactly these same means that, that we operate here. And, and, and being exposed as I am to shipping and other, other industries, I, I don't really see that the cost of delivering product is getting more expensive. Yes, we have the Middle East concerns right now in terms of shipping through those lanes. But remember, if you are a VLCC, a super tanker ship, your, your cost of transport is, you know, into a uh, small one to 2% of the total cargo price. So, so we, we, we're not talking about, you know, things that are, that's going to be detrimental to the, to the outlook. So very much in a deflation camp after having been an uh, inflationist for, for, for a long time, because I really saw the green transformation putting things out of whack. Now, I think people are pushing back on the green transformation, rightly so, in my opinion, not because the, the end goal is wrong. I very much believe we need to do something for, for the environment, but I think we do it both through doing better uh, energy distribution and energy which has far less pollutive and, and in that sense, controlling it through, uh, as we've always done in, in human evolution, we've done it through progress, not because, and let me put this out because this is my favorite analogy. So let's think about green transformation. So if wind and solar was the solution, that is the scientific equivalent of going back to burning woods and coal because they have the same density of uh, energy. Never in history have we created a solution where we would move backwards in terms of energy density. We need higher density, cheaper density, cleaner density in terms of energy. That's why we failed on... We didn't fail on having the right objectives. We failed on actually delivering what makes sense for society, which is a productive um, uh, way of solving the problem. I mean, we could solve for the uh, vaccine for the uh, for the COVID inside 12 months, 
We did uh, the Oppenheimer movie, just made it uh, big in the Oscars. We did the nuclear bomb when it was needed to be done on the research basis. Why can't we get together and actually solve the world's problem on the energy side, getting marginal cost of energy to zero? And think about just conceptually, if we get in a marginal cost of energy to zero, we can deal with all of the poor countries in the world through what? Desalination. You can make the, you know, the most dry desert desalinated uh, through an energy that is a margin cost of zero. We can go, we can create, you know, forests and we can recreate society. We need, we need to be thinking bigger. I'm embarrassed as we, that we as a human mankind think we can tax and pollute ourselves to a better future. We need to develop it. And, and that fits into that inflation question you asked. I know it's a long answer, but I think it's a critical one because I think the, the tonic plates are changing towards something globally, which is more productive. And that's what comes after pretend and extend. We will, in my opinion, be, I know you run, a, you say yourself, you run a doom and gloom program, <laughs> but I'll, I'll be the first one to say, being an old geezer as I am, that I think the next 10 to 15 years is going to be the most productive in human mankind's history. No, it's like we, we try not to be doom and gloom, but it always ends up being doom and gloom. That's that's the thing, because we always look at short-term indicators. And uh, like as, as you probably say, we probably don't think big enough, right? Yeah. So uh, no, and, and rightly so, because it's difficult. Because And, and, and that's one of the problems. I, I read someone, a, a great comment this morning, I think, in the Wall Street Journal, that uh, someone in Chicago on the street was commenting, I don't understand the economist's version of the world. They say I'm having... Uh, real wages increases. But the fact is, when I get my paycheck, I still live paycheck by paycheck. I may get a higher nominal salary, but everything else is equally, if not more expensive. That's also why politically in the opinion polls, you see that inflation is the biggest issue. And the government goes like, oh, but there's no inflation. It's coming down. Look at the success we had. Yeah, but that's one uh, uh, a misuse of the inflation measure uh, for what it actually represents. But secondly, that, that there is uh, the social contract is broken. So then you, you, you touched on the oil price real quick uh, in, in your answer just before. And uh, I, I wrote down one question is the recent oil price spike, is, is that going to cause stagflation? And stagflation means, you know, higher, higher inflation, but weakening economy. Right. Is that something you're witnessing right now? It's more of a short term question, again, coming from that big picture approach that you just had. But it's more of a short term question. I'm curious what uh, maybe ramifications are, because it seems like some of the inflation pressures at least were relieved by lower oil prices. As an investor, it suits me. I, 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 I really think this cycle is about commodities. So, of course, as you know, most indices that you trade in and commodities is bordered by, 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 by the net movement of oil in it. I think there is some supply issues. I still think there is a net demand because what has happened practically is that we have moved on an agenda of green transformation, you know, supposedly solving everything to understanding that in between getting to a better point 10 years or 15 years from now, we actually still need to be fossil energy dependent. And if we need to do that, we need to be doing it in a more efficient way and some in a way which is less polluted. Uh, so to some extent, I think the, 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 the ability of doing sunsets on uh, investment and the likes is still not happening. Uh, so yeah, the capital structure in the, in the oil industry is one where you pay out everything you can right now because you're afraid of uh, regulation, you're afraid of uh, political uh, curfews, you're afraid of investing into it. And just look at the forward curve of oil the discount between spot and, and ten year, five years out, seven years out, which is the typical investment project, is about 50%. Uh, and, and no oil company is going to be doing a lot of new exploration in that space. So you have a limited resource supply due to capital constraints and the cost of capital, uh, coinciding with an economy where we are not getting the full, uh, what people hope for, transformation into to, to, to solar and uh, and, and energy and, and, and windmills and, and the likes. Uh, hence, uh, the net demand goes up. I mean, Kai, there's a reason why your iPhone uh, gets bigger and bigger. It's not because it's smart. It's simply because your electricity consumption through your apps goes up somewhere between 15 and 25% a year. Technology-wise, we can catch up for 10 to 15%. So we leave a deficit of 10 to 25% in terms of electricity consumption. If AI is such a big success that everybody says it is, 
Look at the data center's consumption of energy. It's going uh, exponentially. Cryptocurrencies, which is a favorite of, of many young people today, look at their energy consumption. Energy consumption is going through the roof. So it's really electricity that dictates and the use of electricity that dictates oil. And I don't see no letting go on, 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 the, on the demand side of electricity. Exactly. No, cheap energy was the driver of all growth in the, in the, in the past. That's uh, anywhere in the world. Cheap energy opens the doors to prosperity. Like simple as that, I think. It's 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 a simple most in fact. If you said to me, you, you sort of said, Steen, you can only have one indicator that you can use to trade with. Which one would you keep? I would keep the oil prices. Okay. Now, interesting, Steen. Like, I, I promise you, we do thirty thirty-ish minutes at the beginning. We're already at thirty-five, and we still haven't really tackled two big topics. One again, I want to get back to commodities. Uh, I'm really curious what uh, Doctor, what what do you think of Doctor Copper these days? Um, I, I also threatened to talk about uh, sort of the, you know, the rate hike decisions this year, uh, th this week, sorry, not this year, this week, from the BOJ, Bank of Japan, uh, Bank of England, but also the Fed. Um, but also one one more big topic here is, um, where is it? I wrote it down. I wrote it down. I need to find it. I'm missing it. Uh, commodities. Sorry. I said commodities already. That's what I thought. Um, trying to get make that segue. Maybe we'll make a hard cut here. Let, let, let's talk about uh, commodities first, because uh, China published some uh, some interesting data this morning as well from industrial production and uh, industrial metrics, much higher than expected. Five percent growth was expected. Seven percent uh, was the real number that came in this morning. Um, sort of one what you've been mentioning as well. Are we at the? Do we, do we see a global recovery happening right now as as well? Is China that leading indicator that we should be looking at? I thought China is the leading indicator, but I, but I think and and uh, it, it's it's. Uh... It's an old theory that's been around for a long time. I think that what is really going to drive uh, commodities up is the non-China imports, uh, where China before, of course, was not only the catalyst, but also the impulse of the commodity cycle. I think what we see in terms of uh, increase in, uh, in uh, military spending across the board, the whole NATO question, is, of course, a very commodity-heavy uh, co uh, environment. Uh, I think that uh, the underinvestment into the mining structure leaves mining stocks. I think it's a, it's a, it's a topic you follow quite closely on, on your channel. Uh, probably the cheapest relatively to not only commodity, but the ill wall. And, and that, is, that has to do with the high real rates and the right cost of capital uh, and, and, of course, the regulatory framework. So commodities are under-owned, first of all, which is, is a good starting point. It is uh, probably going to benefit the most if there is as I predict, a rate cycle which is going to be to the downside. And if that rate cycle, as I also try to predict, which, and, and again, my, my predictions are worth zero, but <laughs> if, if, if we're going to go back and at the end of the year, we'll end up having four to five cuts instead of uh, two to three, uh, I think commodities are off to the race. Uh, and net, uh, the demand, as I, as I said on the oil side, is not dissimilar in, uh, and now taking it in Dr. Cover. Copper is where most analysts see the biggest deficit in terms of actual production to supply. But that is also on the premise what what is actually happening in the uh, in in the energy space and the distribution of energy space in terms of uh, green transformation. So, so for every decision, I mean, you've got to create a decision tree. But I'll say right now the odds are pretty well stacked positive for Dr. Carver itself. But also, but it's not a it's not a sign of the global recovery in in, in growth. It's simply it's gotten too cheap relatively to other asset classes, but also too cheap to itself in the sense that the ability to extract from mines uh, they are losing on uh, which is an important technical uh, point. But the iron so the grading of the uh, ores are very very poor. I mean, where you in the past could extract you know. 10, 12 percent, you're down to one, two percent in, in a lot of these ores. So there's also a huge uh, moving down the, the quality pattern in terms of what you get from, from these mines uh, on, on top of the very high cost, cost funding cost and it, the, the, uh, an industry which is, of course, uh, not by me and probably not by you, but by most people seen as something that you should avoid. Uh, no, absolutely. Like the IRR, most mining projects in the copper space is below 20 percent. And that's even using like uh, positive, uh, you know, price predictions here as well. Using four dollars a pound copper, for example, which is actually in, in the historical context a, a very decent price for a pound of copper. But uh, mm -hmm. as you said, there are some very big dynamics at play that could push copper a lot higher. The supply and demand dyma dynamics here is uh, is shocking. If you, if you're outside the industry, something I definitely su suggest to read up on. Right. Um, mm -hmm. 
one, one topic you mentioned is, is the mining stocks. I quickly want to talk about that before we you know, wrap up our conversation with a central bank discussion real quick as well and sort of your expectations for the week. But the mining stocks, uh, GDX, GDXJ as well, um, what, what are your thoughts on that, given also the, the gold price environment we're in? Uh, I'm, I'm classically a macro driver uh, trader, so I like the, the first derivatives or the underlying better than the derivative. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but I know the theme here is that if, as there has been, there is a gold a bull market uh, developing, then normally you would have more leverage in the miners. But it goes back to what I just pointed out. I think the capital structure is too expensive, and, and I think the, 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 the quality of the ores are just poor which means that the, the actual output is, is doubtful. End of the day, that should increase the price and that should increase that cycle. But you need, I, I think similar to a lot of other things, I think the first time Fed cuts interest rate, I think the mi minus is off to the race. Fantastic. Awesome. No, I think that's what everybody's predicting. Let's uh, fingers crossed that that's what's happening because everybody's been predicting a but, recession. But I don't want to make that prediction. I was going to. That's what everybody does. <laughs> uh, everybody's been predicting the, the recession that we're still waiting for as well. So uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. But, Steen, uh, one very last topic because it is happening this week. We need to talk about central banks. And I want to talk about Japan in particular because them changing or their their policies actually in terms of interest rates going somewhat positive uh, in, on the interest rate environment could have huge ramifications globally. And I'm talking about the yen carry trade here um, as well. Do, do you have a perspective on what Japan is going to do and also what the implications could be, even if it's just symbolic at first? Because uh, even if it's 0.1%, I don't think it'll move a lot of dollars. But uh, I think the symbolicism here is quite important. So, so what people need to understand about Japan, and, and I'm fortunate enough to go to Japan a couple of times a year, is that it's a consumption-driven economy. So all of the banks has been told that there will be a hike, or at least a communication of hikes coming in Japan. I'll be very surprised if they didn't do uh, a move where they move from negative to zero. But as you say, probably the more important part is the projection that they're going to put out, the outlook on what's going to happen between now and October. Some of the more aggressive uh, Japanese banks are calling for an additional 25 basis point by October. I think that will dictate it. But the fact of the matter is, and which is slightly you know, annoying, at least for me as a trader, is that I don't think uh, Dollar Yen knows that there is a Bank of Japan meeting overnight uh, going on because Bank of uh, Dollar Yen sits at, at, at uh, almost $150 to the yen and uh, that uh, yen to the dollar, sorry. And, 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 you know, it's so pre-announced, it's so premeditated, it's so leaked uh, in Japan that, that, that that's really what people need to understand, that Bank of Jim has surprised in the past, but it is not their strategy to surprise. So unless they are trying to achieve a dramatic change, as you say, on the capital flow, on the structure of the capital market, but all of the Japanese banks are, as of today, positioned for interest rate to go to zero tomorrow. So I think that out of way. And let me just take quickly the, the other two to, to get you shorter uh, out of this program. Um, Federal Reserve March meeting is a difficult one because it sits in between getting new data and, 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 and still waiting for that first uh, labor market data to deteriorate enough for them to actually move the needle. But I think people will focus on two or three dots, as, as you know already. I don't think that's relevant, but I think that's what people will focus about. Uh, focus on. I, I think it's going to be very difficult for them to move from uh, from two to three, from three to two, uh, simply because it is an election year. I, I think the policy signal embedded in that, that they may not cut interest rate or they are sort of moving back on it, makes it almost impossible for them to move on. And then I think the majority of their talk internally will be on, well, how to deal with this QT situation, uh, which, as you as we pointed out the, between the two of us, uh, liquidity is as constrained as we come out of March uh, into April, and April will be a huge test for the liquidity in the system. And as such, I think that is probably not, not what the market sees, but I think thinking like Powell and, 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 and try to reverse engineer how he's been you communicating in the past, I think he's more concerned about the liquidity question than he is about his dots, because they say themselves the dust doesn't really matter. Uh, we know it doesn't matter, but even they seem to know. And it's very rare if you have central banks meeting, they don't know what they're talking about. But in this case, they, they have said that in the past. And Bank of England, they are simply not in a position yet because what is happening in the UK is that the increase in electricity prices and the support for those electricity prices to the UK consumer 
is going away on April 1st. So the Bank of England really wants to see what happens in April uh, when the prices come down. It's very likely that the headline inflation in, in uh, the UK will get very close to 2% already in Q2, which will leave the room open for them a little bit later to start cutting interest rate. But Bank of England, so in, in sequence here, uh, it's pretty clear ECB will cut in April. Uh, I think Federal Reserve is more likely than not to cut in May. And I think Bank of England is probably trying to do one in June. Oh, fantastic. Okay, I'm, I'm, I wrote that down. April, ECB, May, Fed, and June, uh, uh, BOE. So, fantastic. I've written that down. Because uh, the Fed is like, or sorry, not the Fed, but the EU, like Christine Lagarde said, ah, we haven't even talked about it in the past. So, I'm really curious how quickly that tone is going to change here in the future. Stin, thank you so much for your time. It was a fantastic discussion. I know we could have gone down a lot more rabbit holes, like uh, liquidity impacts, from the Bank of Japan decision, I think is something we could have you know, spent a bit more time on in context of what we discussed the first part of our conversation as well with the um, bank term funding program and the reverse repo facility and just liquidity drainage out of the US as well. So really, really interesting topic. Where can we follow your work, Stan? Where can we follow your predictions? And uh, I, th I think you have a newsletter or at least a blog on the, on the website as well. Yeah, Saxo's research is on something called analysis.saxo, and Saxo is a, is, is a XO. And uh, I'm on Twitter uh, as uh, Steen underscore Jacobson, my name you see on the screen. Uh, you can follow me there. I'm not a prolific uh, 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 tweeter or, or writer of research because, to be honest, I don't really think I have a lot to offer anybody else. I'm just trying to keep uh, an, an even keel and, and be humble about what I consider not only the best, but also the most difficult uh, job in the world to, to be in these markets. Absolutely. Being a CIO right now, I don't think that's an easy job at all, right? Uh, given given all the, the news and noise uh, around us right now. So I have a lot of respect for that. So uh, it's not easy and uh, really appreciative of your time. Stin, thank you so much. And I uh, hope to have you back soon to sort of follow up on the discussion, especially the April, May and June uh, predictions here <laughs> as well. So no, thanks so much for your time and uh, everybody else. Thank you so much for tuning in. This was Soar Financially and we were joined by the Saxo Bank CIO, Stin Jacobson. If you like the conversation, please leave a like. It helps us tremendously gauge whether, we've, whether you thought our guest was interesting, whether we asked the right questions, whether the conversation was of value to you. And of course, leave a comment. Should we ask different questions? What, what do you think? When, when is the ECB cutting? Because I'm personally thinking there is a bit of a race to cut between the, uh, the US and the EU, just from an investment perspective as well, because everybody wants to be more attractive. And uh, what, what does that mean? What's the red tail behind the rate cut decision as well? What, what is happening and what is the investment attractiveness? Really appreciate you joining in. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for getting educated and making informed investment decisions. We'll be back with lots more here on SORP Financially. Thank you.